normally when we say DevOps, we normally think about servers, large scale infrastructure, uh, right? Like a lot of servers, how to scale up servers, how to scale up even logs, how to scale up this and that, right? Is that how we normally think about DevOps, right? Agree, disagree? Okay. So here we have a speaker, Sriram. He runs a company called Watchy. Okay. And uh, before explaining what Watchy is, let me ask you another question. When you go to your hometown, wherever that be other than Bangalore, with your 3G dongle or a 4G dongle, and when you sit at home, does it go to a 2G speed? And it sucks. Skype doesn't work. Gmail doesn't load. HTML Gmail. How many remembers loading HTML Gmail? <laughs> Couple of hands, right? <laughs> okay. Interesting problem. Sriram wanted to solve uh, a live telecast of a village marriage to a, somebody in your relative in the US. Is that even possible? BSNL half the time doesn't work. 3G never works. Here, internet doesn't work. Bangalore. <laughs> so, interestingly, uh, Sriram has built something very interesting. Uh, I don't want to uh, lose the excitement by uh, sharing what he has done. Over to Sriram to share his experience on how he solved a common Indian village problem in terms of how to get good bandwidth in remote areas through a very simple approach. Welcome, Sriram, on the stage. Um, so this is going to be a very different session because last one and a half days, um, uh, most of you uh, were completely engaged with uh, different techniques for deployment, automation uh, for deployment, making the life of a sysadmin, DevOps easier. Uh, but here, uh, I'm going to give you a perspective of a different automation, uh, an automation in the sense uh, which is more relevant uh, to a startup than an enterprise. When you have a very limited number of people working on your product and you have very a uh, small uh, timeline in the sense your budget doesn't help you survive too long. Then how do you automate things so that you can convert uh, a concept to a product and then start selling it? Um, so that is what I'm focusing it uh, for, for the session. Um, so what is automation? What is the purpose of automation? It is not just related to deployment or cloud or uh, that's it. Automation in computer science is basically, I believe there are two, two main uh, uh, reasons. One is to reduce the complexity of a task. Basically, you delegate most of the decision making to a system, and uh, your life becomes simpler. And second, to give to put human in control of a situation. If there is a notification flood, which one you prioritize and handle? If there is somebody which tells you that these are the high priority notifications, you take care of this, then it helps. Um, see, when, when um, see uh, automation, uh, there was a reason uh, one and a half years back, Netflix had an AWS had an outage. The whole data center region got uh, went for a toss. Uh, so because of the Netflix got affected. However, um, the, they, couldn't, they had the whole system automated, but you know, in, in search eventualities, that is where actually human uh, intervention is needed, and uh, the human intervention there was composing a regret email to all the customers. So you know, those are the critical things where a human can do, and the rest of the thing we can delegate to a uh, system. Um, so for a startup, uh, so uh, before going into this, let me introduce myself, you know, uh, uh, some more than uh, what Shrikan said. Um, so I'm the CEO and founder of uh, Watchy Technologies, a 3 year startup. What we do here is uh, we try to see how to improve your internet speed. Uh, so there is a box, um, uh, a nice little box, I can show you the picture later, uh, which takes up to seven wireless connections, 2G, 3G, and 4G, combines the bandwidth and gives you one single high-speed internet uh, to your laptop or your to any network device. Primary use cases for media broadcasting and uh, uh, event managers, uh, uh, news coverage and all that, any live video stuff. Now, we had an idea that we want to do this, but we didn't have a clue how to go about it. We had bits and pieces. We developed the software on x86 platform, but uh, 
once you de deliver an appliance, it has to be a portable, run on battery, so it has to move to ARM platform. So we're doing a lot of R&D. So what is the right ARM processor? What is the right memory uh, 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 size? What is the right USB uh, controller? Because we're doing a lot of things on USB, so we need to have a very stable USB controller. What is the right kernel version? What is the right driver patches? So we had so many um, uh, things uh, in our mind uh, to automate. Uh, so the first thing that we automate is automating an R&D part of it. So our uh, so this is this is a typical uh, our desk where you can see at, at least there are six to seven uh, different boards are there. Some of them are in development. Some of them we are evaluating. Uh, some from TI. Some from Freescale. Some from uh, um, uh, uh, all winner, a Chinese company. So, and we are evaluating different SOMs all at a parallel uh, at the same time. So we are trying to say which gives maximum performance, which is having the lowest power drainage, which uh, uh, is most stable, which has a better thermal capacity. On top of that, which is cost effective and giving the maximum performance. So now imagine we are building uh, all these and uh, for every single variation, we have to do a lot of uh, measurements, um, including the CPU, RAM, uh, power, voltage, um, long duration, uh, how, how it works for long duration, is there any memory leak and all that. So there is a huge matrix we started building and then we realized that it is not possible for uh, earlier that time we were a three member team, uh, so it is not possible for a three member team to do all this. So we thought, let's change the philosophy, let's not do uh, POC and then develop and then uh, ramp up a team and then build a concept, uh, build automation stuff. Let's automate the whole process of building the, uh, the even the POC. So we automated this whole step where uh, uh, we have Jenkins and Robot Framework working together, which builds different firmware for us for all these different versions, which different pa pa uh, patches and kernels. And then all we need to do is quickly connect the cable and then certain uh, test starts running and we get the metrics. And what we do is we spend most of the time looking at the metrics and seeing, okay, this guy is good, this guy is bad, and all it's try these combinations and all that. Another primary thing is, how do you do field testing? See, field testing for us is very uh, critical. This is not a server appliance. It's going to sit in one data center, enough to test in one particular. I'm sure even servers need to be tested across different, uh, different uh, data centers. Uh, but imagine an appliance that has to go to, it can be working in any place. It can be here, it can be in a village, it can be in a train. How do you test on a different scenarios? Uh, so we were doing sending people, uh, engineers, to different places to do the testing. And what is always, some of the testings are good, and some of the testings, the results were completely uh, nonsense. Um, later, we realized that these people were testing near to a women's college. You know? So there are a lot of distractions. We cannot always trust on human uh, 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 nature to actually to do proper testing. Uh, so we cannot take risk of uh, uh, wrong measurements. So we automated the field testing. So you go and set up a device. Basically, this is our device. Uh, the white box, which can be connected to, here it is connected to seven 3G connections. And it was serving around, uh, this is in Chennai, uh, serving around 12.5 uh, Mbps at uh, that place. Um, so we, we need to go to a field and do the measurement, so we have automated that process where we can just ask Robot Framework to do the measurement test and uh, you know even point out some anomalies. And of course, this, have you ever done a long duration test? Uh, I think this is something, um, I don't know how it is directly mapped uh, to a, uh, a cloud deployment uh, perspective, uh, but here we don't have a, a, a tier one, tier two, tier, tier three support, and it's all the developers. And once it is deployed, the box has to perform 24 by seven, at least not 24 by seven. We guarantee for 72 hours at least. So, so we have to do a 24 hour test, 36 hour test, and 72 hours test, and measure uh, the the temperature doesn't uh, go too high, and the box uh, the, uh, the chip, chip is fried or the RAM doesn't spike, there is memory leak uh, in course of time, sometimes the memory leak happens after two, three hours of usage. So definitely, a, a human cannot sit and measure this continuously, it has to be automated. So we, we internally, we decided that let's change our philosophy to, to a, a different approach. Um, so most, uh, how many of you are developers here, or been a developer, or moved to, great. So you, most of you must be knowing what is a TDD, uh, Test Driven Development. So the philosophy of test-driven development says, if you're going to write a function, a logic, first write the unit test case, and then implement the logic. Never write the logic first. So you have, a, let's say, addition of two numbers, then you write the unit test cases. Five plus five should be 10. Five minus five should be, five plus minus five should be zero. 
and then you write some logic, and as, to, as, as long as the logic matches the unit test case, your logic is correct. So that's the concept of TDD. Now, how do you do the automation? So we said, instead of creating manuals and instructions for a human to read and execute on a target device, it can be your laptop, it can be your uh, 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 computer or a server, or it can be our appliance. How do, instead of doing that, why not create an instruction for a computer to handle the target device? So that was the philosophy. Now, what is new about this philosophy? Nothing. People are always writing instructions to the computer to handle a target computer or a target device. There is one catch here. Now, in case, now in case we write something uh, for a computer to handle, uh, let's say, uh, our box, and then uh, it fails. Let's say our box doesn't give, with 73G, doesn't give 15 Mbps. So we consider that it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a failure of a test. Then, a human has to take up the same uh, instructions, run it manually, and see, okay, where, where is it going wrong, right? Now, a computer instruction can be written in any scripting language or, or programming language. Now, if, if a human takes it, a human can be an intern, he can be an outsource consultant, or it can be a busy guy who just needs a couple of minutes to actually look, look through it. He doesn't necessarily have to go through all this programming stuff. He need not be a programmer. He can be an expert, user, user expert or a domain, uh, domain expert. In that case, how do you make sure the automation is told to the computer in a language which is common between a human and uh, a computer. So basically, you have to uh, describe that in a natural language. So that is the only catch. So you write something in a natural language and let the computer automate it, and if it fails, let a human take care of it, uh, go through the natural language, understand it because it's plain English, and then he will uh, try to uh, um, reproduce the same scenario. So the philosophy is tell a computer what to do, not a human. And uh, most of the time, this might not work. In case, if it is not working, what we do internally is we assume that as a bug, uh, a moderate or severe bug, and then raise a bug first, and then start implementing a hack, which is nothing but, you know, whatever, write a script or something like that, and make sure this bug is fixed sooner or later. We don't raise it as a feature. We raise it as a bug. So this is the philosophy part of it. Now, coming... So we are looking at what is the right tool for this. Can I, I mean, there are plenty of uh, automation tools out there, right from AutoIt uh, to Securely, uh, QTP, there are a lot of standard enterprise and open source tools out there. But which, does, which supports our philosophy? Okay, there is something called automation-driven testing. We hacked this concept into doing automation uh, for everything. It, it, this is not, need, need not be applied only for... Uh, uh, testing a search of, uh, after writing a code, but this can be applied for anything, even for building, even for uh, doing an R&D, even doing anything to a system, target system. Now, I will not go through the KDT and DDT part. Um, uh, so, but I'll, I'll, I'll try to explain. KDT is a key-driven testing, um, which has a set of keys. A key is nothing but a statement in a natural language, plain English. Uh, Data-driven testing is a matrix of key-driven testing. I'll just leave you for uh, this for a. Uh, you know, you can go and read it later. What I'm more interested, uh, we have adopted is uh, uh, behavior-driven testing. Have you heard of Cucumber? So Cucumber is a behavior-driven testing. It got quite popular three, four years back, uh, 2008 uh, time frame, because that time I was with Tektronix. I, was, I proposed and developed a test automation system for Tektronix, which is using, Tech is using, uh, you guys know Tektronix? Uh, popular for oscilloscopes. I was working for the MPEG division, uh, analyze, video analysis for them. Uh, so, so that framework is almost adapting the similar uh, no, no, uh, you know, philosophy. And when I came out of tech, I was looking for a similar open source product. And then uh, is when I came across robot framework. Uh, the other, if, you're, if you're a Rails engineer and if you're hell-bent on BDT, uh, you might also try Cucumber. Okay, so this is uh, a little tidbits about Robot Framework. Um, that's a site. It has pretty much all the information, pretty uh, documented and self-explaining. Uh, of course, it's open source, and if you're using Python, uh, then this is a natural fit. And that, that, that doesn't mean that it is not fitting anything else. Uh, it can be easily exp uh, expanded to different languages. We have done that. We have expanded it to uh, UA testing tools, Selenium. They have a standard library for Selenium. They have a standard library. And we have extended it for uh, Sikuli. Have you used Sikuli? Yeah, it's a wonderful tool. If, if you're not, you should try using Sikuli. It, um, it, it might help you to uh, do some kind of uh, automation at the cloud level also. Uh, depends upon how your creativity. 
so it can be integrated with Jenkins and other plugins. What I'm more interested in showing you, uh, you know, a demo of this will be how robot framework can go hand in hand with Jenkins and here the whole uh, system uh, automated. So I'm going to take you to uh, So, robot framework is quite mature in the sense it has, uh, uh, this is sublime, it has multiple supports. Where is the... Okay. So, it has multiple UIs. So, basically, robot framework is a plain, uh, it, it's quite Pythonic in the sense it, 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 it follows a plain uh, ASCII uh, representation. I think the, the representation is heavily borrowed from, uh, uh, this is how you write a test case, the representation is heavily borrowed from uh, markdown language. Uh, don't get boggled down by this format. Once you go through the syntax of this format, it's pretty simple. It's all tab, tab separated uh, uh, stuff. I'm not going to uh, go deep into the syntax of this, but my point of showing you Sublime plugin is to, sh uh, you know, to illustrate that it has already built-in support for Vim, Emacs, Sublime, any popular editor you will think that a programmer might like to use. And, uh, However, it, does, it also has a dedicated UI, uh, which is called as Ride. Uh, this is, of course, written in Python. Um, in this uh, is what I have a few sample test cases that I have, so I can give you an overview of how this test is written. Um, okay, so this is actually taken right from our own setup. So you see the notations on top of that. It can be any string, but this notation is specific to us, which says this test case uses seven Reliance Network dongles. So that is an option we use. Uh, and uh, this is how a typical uh, data-driven test case is happening. So I'm feeding to that combination a link. Uh, and I'm saying, OK, uh, this is the expected time, 10 seconds you should download. And this is the maximum CPU it can reach. And this is the maximum RAM it can take, MB. And you can create a build of matrix of this. You can say different links from different sites. And you can measure or uh, give the matrix. Uh, uh, and you can keep expanding it. So if you have seen this, essentially this matrix is calling a single keyword, which I put here. So basically this calls a single keyword called file download test. So I have associated a keyword with a particular matrix. Uh, it is enough to understand that. And let's go deep into the keyword. That is what, uh, the, uh, what I'm trying to uh, illustrate here. This keyword is actually implemented in natural language. Now for some reason, if this test goes for a toss, uh, anybody can open this and then go through this. It is self-documented, natural language. You can write it in any flexible way. It's not even a DSL. It's not a domain-specific language. And uh, then you can alter the steps. You can add new steps. It will help you come up. It, it, it has an auto-suggestion of already, uh, if a keyword is, uh, is there, it also gives you suggestions of what, is, uh, what does it mean. So here, I'm not sure. Can you read this? Is it visible? Because I tried to zoom max. So it says start timer, monitor CPU for max value, monitor RAM for max value, download a file. Uh, the file link, of course, you pass it here. And then it says stop timer and stop other things and then match whether it suits it. So let's run this test for now. Uh, so I have connected to this my tablet, which is tethered to this. So this is a download test. So I'm going to run. Right, what's happening is it, it, it is trying to download, a system, uh, download the file and try to verify it has failed. So that is good. I can show you a failure log also. So then I open this log. Uh, the log file came here. So the test case failed because uh, CPU is running at 90.
let let me go back to the test case and uh, you know try to quickly say that don't bother about that so he, this is a notation that we are using you can actually say cpu should be sho uld should be greater than 90 also is fine so i'll co i'll come to the magic how this thing is getting uh, let's say cpu is, can be 100 not a problem i think this should fix it Pass. So good. So now I can show you the pass log also. So this is all test cases passed. If you want to drill down, you can go here and see what each keyword in that particular uh, test did and how much what what are the uh, what what was its output and all that. Now, where is the magic happening? We wrote something in English. We wrote uh, and then it started executing and then we had this value test successfully run. So the magic is happening in the philosophy of uh, behavior-driven testing. So th these test cases uses uh, what do you call a keyword. A keyword is nothing but, let's say, uh, in our case, a top-level keyword is file download test. And then it says start timer. So a keyword is nothing but can be defined as a collection of another set of keywords. So, so it can loop down like that. And finally, the base keywords are the ones which are actually implemented in whatever language you prefer. Now, there is a philosophical change in this. So it gives the freedom of writing the test case by a uh, you know, non-programming guy. He need not know any coding. He can go write uh, a test case in a natural language. And he can start reuse. As soon as he writes a keyword, it gets uh, uh, stored and started to be pr presented in the IntelliSense. And he can start extending these keywords for other test cases. So basically, somebody will sit overnight and write all the 100 cases, 100 test cases. And next day you come up and see, you will have the base level test cases. That may not be 100, it might be like 20, 25 base level test cases, because these keep on re getting re reused. And then you decide what is the right language to implement those base level test cases. In our case, we have implemented them in Python, but it can also be extended to multiple, uh, any different languages using a simple wrapper, Python wrapper. And then you start uh, using, so you're isolating uh, the test case writing phase uh, from a development phase, all but assuring that automation is going to happen right from the beginning. So I'm going to show you a small video clip. Uh, okay, I'm going to show, uh, do I have time for a video clip or a, should, it's a one minute, less than a minute, which shows the integration to uh, uh, Jenkins. So, uh, Okay, this is, this is, uh, try to get the context, if not the details, that is, that's fine. So we have a test case here, and uh, we ran the test case, and this is how we configure a Jenkins project. Uh, this can be a build project, or it can be uh, a, a, any, uh, you can directly say, uh, why don't you do a field test? So it doesn't have to always be triggered after a code build. You can manually go, you can configure such a way that you want to do many different tasks. You can also specify, what Jenkins should consider, 50% of the test case pass, you should consider it this, uh, this activity is a success. So the build is happening. And then what happens is, the result is actually integrated into Jenkins, and uh, you can use Jenkins propagation feature, the emails and alerts to forward to that. And, and meanwhile this is happening, let me also give you uh, some of the nice hacks we did. Uh, if you see, uh, let, let this go to. So the result is integrated, right? A graph into the Jenkins, and then you have uh, the test case details also embedded within the Jenkins uh, uh, dashboard. So we did it in a uh, way that, for example, there is a test case where we put all the Reliance network dongles into the box and test it. Now, after the test suite is done, uh, suite is done, you want to replace that with the Tata Photon dongle. So how do you do that? 
so what we made is uh, we made a robot framework to actually run all the test cases, then send us an email. So somebody, one of the team uh, team member will see the email. He knows the the, the robot framework tells uh, him what is the next combination of dongles to be connected. Then the person goes manually connects those dongles and then comes back and say uh, replies to the same email done. And then the robot framework continues its test from there. So it is continuously running the test in the background. Uh, so so that, I hope that has given you a context of uh, what is the robot framework and uh, how it can be used for a small team. And uh, if you can uh, put in your creativity, you can use it to automate anything, not just the test, uh, code testing. Thank you. Wonderful. And yeah. if there is any questions, do I have time for uh, questions? Is there one interesting QA that anybody wants to ask? Any question which is like, anyone in the back here? Yeah, yeah. there you go. So basically, this will connect to, connect to a, uh, different types of OSS ultimately, right? Exactly. So, so then, uh, then there there must be some firmware running on your device. Not necessarily. Uh, so, uh, earlier somebody was talking about Ansible, right? It's a similar logic. You just need an open SSH server uh, running on it. Everything is done over the SSH. Okay. Okay. Cool. Thanks. Thanks. So the so the appliance doesn't uh, appliance of the server doesn't need to have any uh, daemon running on top of it to listening uh, to listen to the robot framework. So, thank Wonderful. you. Wonderful, sir. Now you know if your village happens in the wedding, what to do? Mm -hmm. Call him and live stream it. Wonderful round of applause.